I just started doing JavaScript a couple months ago, so all of this is uh, fairly new to me. Uh, but I thought it was interest. Uh, I thought it would be interesting to actually bring something to you guys that might be uh, a little bit different than what you're used to seeing. Um, um, so I'll talk a little bit about Python uh, and just a brief introduction. So um, I'm actually an architect by training and not a software architect, but an actual building architect. Um, I worked for about four or five years in the industry before I started doing software development. It's this perfect blend that it's half architect and half software developer. Uh, and I basically try to help the company build integrations that help them do sort of traditional architecture, but leveraging technology wherever we can uh, to, you know, to make the company more efficient in, in building new build buildings. Uh, you can find me on Twitter and GitHub at gtalarico. And I have a couple open source projects that are in this kind of intersection of architecture and uh, technology. So my uh, web uh, developer career goes back to 1999 when I released uh, Talarico's page. This was my first uh, web development project built in uh, front end and hosted on GeoCities. Anyone knows GeoCities? Yeah? Yes. Uh, and then, you know, life kind of happened and I went to architecture and uh, I've always had a passion for technology and software development, but it kind of uh, went to the back seat and I got an architecture degree. Uh, of course, my thesis project was a data center because uh, I just wanted to stay as close as possible to all the nerdy things I love the most. Um, and I also really enjoyed uh, all kinds of different complexities within architecture. Uh, this is uh, sometimes referred to things that are parametric design. So they're essentially objects or shape that it's very hard to actually do it by hand. So you really have to leverage technology. So uh, one of my main projects after graduating was this project. It's the headquarters uh, for DC Water down in Washington, DC. And when you get into buildings that have sort of non-regular shapes, you actually really need to uh, leverage technology and oftentimes make your own software and your own uh, add-ins on top of traditional softwares to allow you to actually build uh, non-regular you know, shapes. So um, this building, I actually just found out as I was pulling up pictures for this presentation that it's actually almost built. Uh, so I was pretty excited to see that. And one of my main uh, kind of responsibilities in this project was to actually not do the traditional architectural roles, but to help manage all the kind of the data in the project, right? So you had 2,000 panels that wrapped around this building. And uh, to actually do that with traditional blueprints, uh, it's very hard to do. So my main role was to actually write uh, really kind of simple scripts and uh, in connect different applications together to help uh, the architects actually manage all the data in the project. And my first actual introduction to coding was through uh, visual programming. So this is a platform called Grasshopper, uh, which you basically uh, kind of create relationships. And you, you actually code by just connecting things together. It's actually quite interesting. Uh, but this was sort of a, a little interface that allowed me to control all the aspects of that building. And this was really how I actually got into coding. And from this, I basically started uh, writing, substituting parts of, of these uh, workflows with short uh, Python scripts, which is how I actually got into Python. And then the second part is uh, we would take these traditional uh, uh, kind of architectural authoring programs, this one that you see on the screen, it's called Revit. So it's what, what architecture is actually used to design uh, buildings and blueprints. And what I would do is I would create custom integrations and add-ins. They would sort of uh, extend Revit to allow me to do things uh, beyond what it's offered out of the box. And one of the things that I ran into is uh, this software had an SDK, but the SDK documentation was only offered in this uh, little help file. There was actually no documentation on the internet at all. And I wanted to hate myself every time I needed to look something up. I needed to install that in every computer, and I need to have one of these for each version of the program. So, I made it as sort of a, a personal summer project to actually take all this information and put it into a proper website that other people could use it. And at this point, I had not developed any website beyond the one that I showed you earlier in the presentation. So uh, this was, this was uh, kind of a big challenge to me. And um, I did it using uh, Python Flask and Jinja, which is a really simple uh, uh, templating engine. 
Um, and it was actually easier than I thought. I put it together in about two weeks. So there was a Python script that would extract all the information from that help file, and then uh, some really simple template in using a bootstrap or bootswatch, I think I actually used uh, as a template. Now, what I found out is as soon as I released that, I found out there were a lot of other people that were interested in that. And pretty soon, uh, this website now has actually had almost 2 million page views, and it's used all over the internet. So basically, every architect who develops, like myself, uses that and actually relies on it quite a bit. So I, f I felt a lot of pressure to actually uh, uh, improve and, and make the website better and more maintainable uh, and actually open source it so people could collaborate. So I started putting quite a bit of time for adding new features and my own search engine and uh, 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 filters and different, different things. So I had to actually go beyond what I knew uh, in just HTML and CSS and started writing a little bit of jQuery to add some of those interactions. And um, I put it together. So even today, most of the website is actually held together duct taped together with jQuery and, and Flask. But it also made me realize that if I actually needed to do uh, proper or more complex web development, I really needed to learn a framework. So um, not being a JavaScript developer, uh, it was very confusing. Uh, I tried learning Angular for about a month, and I wanted to cry every night. Uh, it was very painful. I thought the documentation was hard to understand. and. There was that, uh, those issues with Angular 1 and Angular 2, and I basically gave up and went back to doing architecture. Um, uh, a couple months ago, uh, in October, there was a project at work that I thought really needed a proper web platform. So I started uh, kind of trying it again, and I ran into Vue. And I was actually really impressed with how, how, uh, how good Vue was and how easy it was to learn. Um, just a, a, a quick stats that I looked up uh, for this presentation. So uh, this is a, a, a report by JetBrains uh, on the state of Python. And it turns out about 54 of all Python developers uh, use, uh, use Python for some sort of web development. And also 50% of Python developers also use JavaScript. So I basically wanted to you know, be one of those. And I thought it would be really powerful to actually learn not only Vue, but JavaScript as sort of a second tool. So um, as I mentioned, I picked Vue uh, out of everything that I've tried. It was the most approachable one. So I think in the JavaScript world, it's probably the closest thing to uh, Flask. So it's very well documented. It's very approachable, easy to understand, and, and very powerful. And I think those exact same things apply to Flask. Has anyone actually used Flask? Yeah, awesome. So it's very. Uh, I would, say, I, would, I would say it's also progressive, so you can start very simply and with few things, and you can kind of add it as you go. So uh, I think they're really the perfect combination. Now, that also didn't come without uh, problems. So the first thing I noticed when I started this in October of last year is I didn't find any precedence. So I basically Googled Flask view template, nothing. I mean, I Photoshopped this. It wasn't actually zero, but there really wasn't. Uh, uh, very good examples. I couldn't find any precedence of how people kind of attach these two things together. Uh, the other problem is they actually use the same delimiters. So the Jinja template, template engine actually used the double curly braces. So you basically, the, first, the only things I found when I Googled was people fi trying to figure out how to change the delimiters in one of the two languages, which is kind of a nightmare. Uh, so I didn't do that. And the third thing is, if you're actually serving your application with Flask, then you can't take advantage of the Webpack uh, development server and hot module replacement and all those things. So this is just the traditional Flask server. And then lastly, uh, it can get confusing, right? Because now you have sort of two different languages. You're you know, running two uh, development servers. So uh, it took me a little while to wrap my head around it and come up with a, a good kind of architecture for how I wanted to, to uh, uh, attach those two uh, languages together. But I think it's totally worth it. And I'll show you uh, the projects that I've built with it since. So uh, just a, a couple recommendations and things that I've learned if anyone ever decides to go that route. Uh, but the first thing is don't use Jinja. So if you're going to go that route and you're going to embrace Vue and JavaScript to handle your front end application, then basically don't use 
anything on the Python side that tries to do that because it doesn't do as well as uh, the JavaScript tooling does. The second thing, and I made that mistake uh, when I developed that website I mentioned, Revit API Docs, is don't try to actually pass data between your Python server and your, your view. Uh, I would try to actually inject variables into the rendering, and that very quickly got out of hand. So I've now keep a 100% separation, and all that the Python server does is serve the entry point into view, and everything else is just done with uh, uh, API requests through the Flask application. And then lastly, don't try using Python to manage your front-end assets. So Python has uh, web... Um, things called web assets or Flask uh, assets, which does something similar to Webpack, so it's able to do your you know, CSS uh, pre-processing and bundle all your assets together. But again, uh, those will not play very well with the rest of Webpack, like the development server and the bundling. And they're also just not as good, because JavaScript, I think, has really uh, uh, built some fantastic tools for these types of things. And the things that you do want to do is the first thing is you actually want to use uh, both the Python server and the view server together. So what happens is if you just run Python, you would have to build your view application and then you can serve it with Python, which is what happens in production. But if you do that during development, you can't do live reloading, which is uh, very painful. Uh, but you do need to run Python so that you can actually serve the API uh, call. So what I end up doing is I always open both of them and I run both servers in parallel. Uh, this I mentioned earlier, so let view handle the view. Uh, don't try to do any of that with Jinja or Python. And I mentioned this as well, so just use requests to pass the data back and forth. And then lastly, uh, use custom commands. So because this is kind of a atypical, uh, uh, I think, workflow, uh, you have to, you have to uh, build, I think, little automations to make it very easy. So I basically took everything that I've learned here and I put it together as a template. So I stripped out all the irrelevant portions of the, the structure that I came up with, and I published as a Flask Vue.js template uh, about a month or two ago. It already has actually over 100 stars in GitHub, so it turns out quite a, there are a few other people like me that do enjoy this, uh, this kind of mix. Uh, it lets you use your Python backend to take advantage of all the really powerful Python libraries for handling you know, data sciences and algorithms and machine learning, whatever you need. You can use Python for that, and then, of course, let Vue do its thing in the front end. Uh, the, the template uh, basically ships with a really simple Flask API, uh, Flask REST Plus for a REST API. And then on the Vue side, I just included a couple things out of the box. I actually just updated it this weekend to include Vue CLI 3, uh, so it would be easier to kind of maintain the template moving forward. And it also includes just a couple CLI commands for making the, the development a little bit faster, and then some configurations to deploy it on Heroku really easily. <laughs> uh, that's it. Thank you.